Welcome to 2819. This is the show where we hope to inspire you to go out and make disciples of all nations. I'm Sandra Dimas. And I'm Krista Bontrager. And this is the television outreach of Reasons to Believe, a viewer-supported ministry where science and faith converge. And we want to help you explore how you can use an evidence-based approach in your personal evangelism with your family and friends. Yep, and you know what? As you're watching the show, we just want you to get connected with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Get connected with us. Let us know where you're watching and uh, what you think of the show. So check us out at 2819 Show. We'd really love to hear from you. So we're going to kick things off here with a quick rundown of what we're going to do today. In our Give and Take segment, our Scholar team is ready over on the couch to get us started with a lively conversation looking at the question, does evolution prove God doesn't exist? That's a good question, and I want to know the answer. But you know what? Another question I have is, where are you going for Thanksgiving? Ooh, always go to my mother's house. I'm an only <laughs> child, so that's the one road. Oh, you to... better go. Yeah, I better go. <laughs> Fam family is where it's family at. Family first. So uh, speaking of Thanksgiving, Monica is going to give us a Thanksgiving greeting, especially from everyone here at Reasons to Believe. So I think she has a special video for you. I know we're all so grateful for your support and helping to make this show happen. And our, our pick of the week segment today, we have a great clip from a recent interview with Kenneth Samples. You know, it was Reformation Sunday yep. just a few weeks ago, 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses on this door at Wittenberg. So we've got a great clip of Ken talking about, you know, what is the difference between Catholics and Protestants? You know, what's going on there? It's going to be a good conversation. Yeah, I want to hear that. And I want to see if he's going to make any nailed it jokes. That'll be, <laughs> that'll be interesting to check it out. And uh, something else that we're going to be doing, Krista, you are going to be talking to Fuzz about how we can share our faith with others if we're not an expert. So I, as a non-expert, need to know. That's how. right. We're going to... It's getting up to party season yep. and a lot of traveling. You might be encountering someone, what I call like a divine opportunity, that moment to share your faith. We want to get equipped for that. And in today's Culture Talks segment, Sandra is going to be talking with Kenneth Samples about the question, why should Christians read books besides the Bible? I mean, really, isn't the Bible all we need? My library card is in full use all the time. But first, let's check out what our senior research scholar Jeff Zwerink has to say in our Give and Take. Hello, and welcome to Give and Take. Here we look at science issues to equip you to spread the gospel. Today, we want to look at a question that's often out there. If evolution is correct, does that mean the atheists are right and there is no God? Joined today by Fuzz and AJ, we're going to dig right in. So Fuzz and AJ, how would you respond to that question? If, if evolution is correct, does that mean atheism's right and God just isn't there? I don't think so. I think that the atheists are still left with something to ground the beginning and all of the processes that they observe in nature and in the universe around them. Okay, so... They're so, still left with that problem, even if evolution is completely true. Okay, well, let me, let me ask a, a, a kind of a different question there. Let's go a little bit different for a little while. What is evolution? And so what are we talking about when we say evolution? I think it's basically change. Uh, and evolution in science can mean change on many different levels. It can mean it on a micro level, or it can mean it on a macro level. Okay. Mi micro level would be like in a cell or in a, in a single cell organism or even in a multicellular organism. But on a macro level, that would be those larger changes from species to a totally different kind of so, species. So time. the micro would be the bacteria developing resistance to an antibiotic, whereas the That's macro right. would be a elephant becoming a giraffe. Exactly, okay. or something like that. Some, yeah. well, maybe not quite so big. <laughs> yeah. and, and I know, you, I just, I think you've actually delineated even some more different divisions of evolution. Yeah. I, I'm going to ask you to just flesh those, or to, to briefly say what they are, because we're going to come back and hit those. Sure. In, Fuzz in and I have minutes. talked about this a lot, but we basically break it down into five categories. Chemical evolution, which would be origin of life, life from so this inorganic. Is how do you get the original chemicals to form something that's self-replicating, whatever life is? Self-replicating and alive, okay. yes, basically. And then there would be microevolution. Uh, okay. And then microevolution is basically you know, mutations that are selected for by some type of selection process that give benefit or fitness advantages to the organism that has that mutation. So this is the bacteria developed 
developing resistance So if you, resistance take, if you actually take like it that. into an organism, like a single cell organism, like a bacteria, that would be microbial evolution, and that would okay. be one example of, of microevolutionary okay. processes. What's the next level? The next level would be speciation, uh, which is the ability of a species or a kind, like human beings, to adapt to different types of environments or environmental, environmental stresses. Okay. And for those adaptations to actually push in a particular direction that might even actually lead to something that looks like an isolated group of reproducing uh, a reproducing population, right? And, and so, I gather there's a little bit of difficulty discerning species at some level in that. Ver the, very, there's correct? not just a little bit a little of difficulty. Bit. Okay, that's, 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 a, that's a very fuzzy boundary. All right, great. Right? That's good to know. So what's what's next? And then the fifth one would be macroevolution, which is basically that that type of speciation. Uh, uh, adaptability that is built into our genomes and can lead to these types of different populations becoming isolated, that over long periods of time, that actually accounts for the different phyla that we see, large groups of very different kinds of animals. Okay, so this is change on the big scale. I mean, it, some of it's changed from a very small scale up to a very large scale. That's right. Is what it amounts That's right. To. Okay. So let me ask uh, you know, kind of the question that I think most everybody wants to know. Does the scientific data force us to accept these kinds of evolution? Well, Puzzle, I don't, th I don't think so, yeah. to you. Well, I mean, I would say the answer is no. Uh, I mean, you know, clearly um, evolutionary biologists would argue that there's compelling evidence for an evolutionary history to life on Earth. And, and so this is the macroevolution, everything encompassed in Exactly. It. And they would point to things like shared biological features among organisms, with the argument being that those shared features must be found in the ancestral organism that gave rise to the different lineages. Or they might point to the fossil record and say, look, we see a history of life on Earth where there's different life forms at different times, so hence life evolved. But there are plenty of reasons to, th to uh, think that this evolutionary mechanism in a broad sense is uh, insufficient to account for the origin, the history, and the design of life. Well, so, so what are kind of t two or three of your best examples? Well, for example, uh, I would point to the origin of life question. That's right. uh, okay, so this is the original chemical evolution. That's exactly right. You know, even um, people that are atheists, that are deeply committed to the evolutionary paradigm, that are actively working on that problem, will readily admit we have no explanation for how life originates. Or you look at an event like the Cambrian Explosion, which is the, the first appearance of complex animals on the surface of the Earth. So this would be kind of up at that species level uh, or even, mac or even phylum, beyond the phylum level. At the, at the okay. phylum right, level. So this is a big deal. Right. There's just not an explanation for why suddenly, virtually out of nowhere, in a geological instant, we see this explosive appearance of all these different uh, animal phyla. So, okay. so these are two places where the paradigm at this point in time has no explanation for these events in life's history. So, so would this, this is a, a place where it's, there's not an adequate explanation. So are you saying, well, okay, obviously God did it here, or what are you saying? No, I, I would say that, that, that uh, it means that it's in, um, un unsustainable to say that life's origin, history, and design can be completely accounted for through evolutionary mechanisms, because these are places where it's clearly clear at this point in time that that's not the case. Okay, so, so stated it another way, it's not that uh, we can necessarily say where God intervened or not, or, but the, to say, to claim that evolution accounts for everything and therefore God doesn't exist is inadequate because there are these clear places where the mechanism is insufficient at this point. Yes. Not even weighing in on what might we find in the future. That's exactly right. Okay. Right. Yes. So let me let me throw a, a different question out there. You know, we've talked a little bit about what evolution is, what it can't, or some of the problems with it. I actually like to add something to what Please, evolution yeah. is because you guys have already touched on it in, in Fuzzo's question and response. But but evolution can also mean that overarching paradigm, which is really a commitment to naturalistic mm -hmm. explanations for the origin and the history and the diversity of life on Earth. So we also have to think about that sixth category, which is sort of overarching all of the other categories, and it's really, it's really a philosophical paradigm. Yeah. So, okay, so if, if I were to characterize it then, or what, what that sounds like to me is that there's two things. One is there may be process and mechanism that might explain some of this, but there's another level of evolution which says we can explain this all apart from God effectively, is what that means. Yes. Um, is, that a, is that a legitimate, or, Say, say we find something that explains all the mechanism. Does that mean that God isn't there? 
I certainly don't think so. Again, you know, I, I think if you, if you want to appeal only to the evolutionary mechanism and you want to remain sort of agnostic as to what science will be able to describe in the future and, and even be very optimistic and say someday science can explain it all, it can't ever explain it all. It can't explain sort of the nature of nature or the fact that nature is the way that it is and why there is something rather than nothing. So why it's the it makes, why, why are we here? Why does it exist the way it does? Why does it make thing? sense? Yeah, why can rational creatures make, ex make sense out of it and do experiments on it and actually gain knowledge from it. I mean, all of that needs an explanation too that is outside of the, the capacity of a naturalistic explanation. So, so Fuzz, I mean, so how would you, are, are you comfortable with the idea that process can explain everything? Do you think we're going to find the origin of life and the Cambrian explosion? And if we do, would you, would, what, what, what would you wrestle with? with that? Well, I mean, I think AJ makes a good point that God could create exclusively through process. Mm -hmm. But as somebody who's a creationist, I, would, I argue that God creates not only through process, but also through intervening in a direct personal way. And I actually think that the origin of life is one of those places where God has intervened in a, in a direct personal way to bring about his creative purposes. I think when it comes to the origin of humanity, that's another place where, it, to me, it seems like there is some kind of intervention that must have taken place, particularly when you talk about the fact that human beings seem to be exceptional we stand mm -hmm. apart from all other creature. There's this quality that we would call the image of God as Christians that, that seems to set human beings apart from all their creature. And, and there's just not an evolutionary mechanism for where that exceptional nature mm -hmm. to humanity comes from. From an evangelistic standpoint, how do you see this play out in discussions? Is the God used all process or God intervening? I mean, what have you seen work and not work there? Well, and from, in my experience, if somebody is deeply committed to the evolutionary paradigm, to say to them that maybe God used process exclusively to bring about his creative purposes, to those kind of people, it just sounds like religious talk. They're not really impacted by that. It doesn't compel them to think or wrestle with right, issues. It, it okay. doesn't. And so what I find is you, you've got to be disruptive to their paradigm. You've got to go in there and show, look, the origin of life at this point doesn't have an explanation or the Cambrian explosion doesn't have an explanation uh, to force them to begin to think that maybe their worldview may be lacking and that there may be something to the Christian perspective. So last question here, briefly answered, 10 seconds or less. What do you find the most disruptive piece of scientific evidence? To me, it's the origin of life. Origin of life? I would have to agree, the origin of life. The origin of life. Yeah. So as we've wrestled here, uh, the idea that evolution explains everything, really there are problems with that. There are origin of life issues. There's the Cambrian explosion that certainly prevent us from saying that evolution accounts for everything. But even if there is process that God uses, which I think we find in the Genesis account, there's still lots of evidence that point to God's creative work in preparing us. And that is one of the things we can use to go out and disrupt the naturalist worldview and help them consider the claims of the gospel and spread uh, the message of Jesus to them. You know, Sandra, one of the things I love about Reasons to Believe is our scholar team, they're not afraid to tackle the tough questions. Nope, not scared at all. And they've got tough answers for those questions. That's right. And evolution's <laughs> a tough question. <laughs> well, next up, we're going to be watching Ken Samples, he was recently interviewed on Truth Matters. That's a show by our friends over at Ratio Christi. Yep. They were talking about the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses on the door at Wittenberg. You know, but this really raises the larger question, why did the church need a reformation? And, you know, what's the difference between Catholics and Protestants? Very important question. Ken's going to break that down for us right now. Tell us the two key differences. Well, let's check it out. Uh, what were the major differences between the, the Protestant reformers and the Roman Catholic Church? Yes. Uh, so 500 years ago, today, of course, is 2017. We go back to 1517 in the 16th century. A Luther, who is an Augustinian monk, he is a person who has lots of questions and doubts about whether he can have assurance of his salvation. And he lives at a time in which the church has experienced quite a bit of corruption. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church 
is attempting to rebuild St. Peter's Cathedral and they're, they're fundraising, they're involved in collecting money to rebuild the church. And the Reformation centers in the idea of an indulgence that if you give money to the church, then time in purgatory, that is when a person dies and their state of sanctification doesn't allow them to enter into heaven, they'll go to purgatory where they'll experience some kind of purgation of their sins. Well, this idea struck Luther as very foreign and unbiblical. And he nails his 95 theses on the Wittenberg church door in Germany, a sign of uh, protest. Uh, but slowly and gradually, that leads into a greater controversy. And I think it's fair to say that really the Reformation differences between the Roman Catholic Church and what would become the Protestant Church, Martin Luther being the father of the Protestant Reformation, but other reformers coming after him, Zwingli, Knox, Calvin, etc. I think that there are two major issues and a, a number of other issues that are kind of secondary. Uh, the first question, the first issue is soteriology. How is a Christian saved? And in the Roman Catholic tradition, uh, it comes through the sacraments. Sacramental grace begins at your baptism. As you participate in the sacraments of the church, it brings you to a state of sanctifying grace. So you're saved by grace that comes through the church. Uh, it is through faith, believing in uh, the God of historic Christianity, the person of Jesus Christ, but it's completed by doing works, uh, by doing good works. And so this controversy of grace, faith, and works was one that Luther took issue. Luther said that justification is not um, both an inward transformation uh, and a declaration of righteousness. Uh, rather, we're justified, we're saved by grace alone. It comes through faith alone, uh, and it is in the person of Christ. So soteriology, or how a person is saved, these issues of of grace, faith, and works. The secondary issue, a second issue, certainly isn't secondary, is the question of authority. The Catholic Church took a two-source authority. Uh, there is scripture, but there is also the teaching magisterium of the church. And so the Pope, the College of Cardinals, the scholars would be the one who would interpret scripture in light of sacred tradition. The Protestants, of course, asserted in Latin sola scriptura, that scripture is the supreme authority, that scripture judges tradition and all other authorities. Uh, and there are other issues. Who saves me? Is it, is it Christ? Is it Mary? Is it the saints? But I would say that soteriology, the question of salvation, and the question of authority, uh, what is scripture's relationship to tradition, were the primary issues at stake in the Reformation. And for more information about our friends at Ratio Christi, I want to encourage you to check them out on the web at ratiochristi.org. And now it's time for RTB 101, and this is the segment where we talk about practical questions to equip our viewers to share their faith with their friends and family more effectively. Today I'm here with RTB's Vice President of Science Apologetics, biochemist, Dr. Fuzz Rana. Welcome, Fuzz. Hey, Krista. Glad to have you here today. And I want to talk about those, what I like to call divine opportunities, those moments that we have that maybe we're going to be at a holiday party coming up, or maybe we're taking a trip, we're on an airplane, and we encounter somebody that we find ourselves in a faith conversation with them, and maybe they're more of an analytical type of person, they're more of a thinker, maybe they even are a scientist. So let's just kind of imagine a scenario right now. I'm gonna pick on your mom, okay? Let's say your mom's on an airplane coming out to visit you and she finds herself sitting next to a scientist. Should she even try to engage him in a conversation or is that like not a good oh, idea? Oh no, I think it's a great idea. Because she's not a scientist. Oh, it's a great idea to okay. engage him in a conversation. And 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 I think the, the first thing that we wanna do is, is let them know that we are interested in them for who they are. Okay. And so if this is a scientist, I think it's natural to ask them, well, what was it like to become a scientist? How did you go about that process? And what did you study? And you could ask them about their research. You know, what are they working on now? Uh, 
and, and those kind of questions just to, to, to give them the sense that you care about them and you're interested in them. That's are some fantastic practical questions because I don't know if I would know right away what to ask a scientist. I might just feel a little intimidated and think like, ooh, there's a, they're a scientist. I don't, you know, maybe I'll take a nap on the airplane. But those are some great yeah. ideas of what I could ask. And then once you get them talking, you can become a little bit more philosophical. What is it that you find fascinating about science? Oh, okay. You know, um, what really drew you into science? Uh, do you think that when you, you study nature as a scientist that you're discovering beauty? Do you think things are beautiful? Do you think things are remarkable? And almost all scientists are gonna say yes to those questions. And then you might even say, well, do you think that God exists as a scientist? And, you know, and if they say no, ask them, well, why not? You know, get them talking, find out what they think and what they, what, what they believe about those kind of questions. So really the power of questions is what's driving that conversation. Exactly. So it's not a telling conversation, it's not a debating conversation, it's just really an inquiry into another human being to find out more about right. them. And then I think at that point you could say, look, you know, I'm a Christian and you shouldn't give them reasons why they should become a Christian but rather reasons why you are a Christian. Okay. What, what makes you believe that God exists? What makes you think that Christianity is true? And then, you know, uh, continue the conversation by asking them, well, what do you think about that? Okay. So now if, if I'm in that kind of airplane scenario or at a dinner mm -hmm. party, maybe I want to help encourage them to continue the discovery. What kinds of resources would I, might I, yeah. encourage them to check out and maybe what even like do I yeah. not want to recommend? Well, you know, the thing you, that you want to do is is point out the fact that there are uh, men and women of science who are Christians. And so point them to websites that uh, are websites that represent scientists that are working in uh, in faith areas. So, so they could check out reasons.org. Reasons.org would be a prime example or recommend a book that they might check out that reflects their interest. Now it could be that that person might be a biochemist, but maybe they have an interest in cosmology. So by asking questions, you're going to be able to identify that resource, that book, uh, a video that they might find interesting and then offer to gift it to them. Those are some great tips, Fuzz, and I hope that everyone out there watching us right now as they're engaged in their holiday parties and their holiday travels, they'll have a little more courage to step into those uh, divine opportunities and take that moment for Jesus. I wanna encourage everyone to check out on our reasons.org website, the key phrase, apologetic strategies for more tips. There's some articles there that I've written along these lines. So I wanna say once again, thanks for joining us, Dr. Fuzrana. And now I think we're gonna go over to Monica. She's gonna give us a special Thanksgiving greeting from our team here at Reasons to Believe. Hey everyone. Well, I don't know about you, but this is one of my favorite times of the year. I love that the California weather starts to cool down from like the 2000 degree heat we've been having. And I love that we get to just eat so much like baby turkeys. Some of you might call that chicken. Anyway, I, I feel like people just are so much more grateful. They're so much more thankful. We get to see family and friends that we don't always get to see. It's just a great time to reflect on all the blessings that we truly have. I also love working here at RTB during this time. We get to recap on all the amazing things that we've done during the year. It's really because we have such awesome, faithful supporters and friends of the ministry who stand by us and support our mission. So our team here put together a video just to highlight some of those things that we've done throughout the year that you helped us to accomplish. We thank you for standing alongside us and making all these things possible. So take a look. Roll the clip, Nick! Happy Thanksgiving from Reasons to Believe. We're giving thanks for all of our friends like you because of the amazing things you made possible this year. In addition to books, blogs, videos, and social media, we had a great opportunity to encourage believers and engage with skeptics face to face. Because of you, 670 people were better equipped for evangelism through AMP 2017. As well as the Alaska Cruise Conference and Total Solar Eclipse event that connected and energized nearly 300 people to appreciate the wonder of God's creation and share their faith. 
your faithfulness also reached to thousands of people at this year's National Conference on Christian Apologetics as our scholars presented new reasons to believe to curious audiences. Because of you, thousands learned why they can trust in the transcendent God revealed in both nature and the Bible. None of this could have been done without you. We are truly grateful to God and you. From our family to yours, peace and blessings for a happy Thanksgiving. I hope you enjoyed that video that we put together to just highlight some of the things that we've been able to accomplish. We thank you for your support and prayers for the ministry and staff here. Have a blessed Thanksgiving and holiday. Oh, Monica, she is a, a joy and uh, you also are joys. So we wanna thank you for your support for this year. And today at Culture Talk, we have philosopher and theologian Ken Samples with us and he's also Ken. In an avid book reader. So we're both yes. fellow bibliophiles. And one That's of right. the things that we love to talk about is our love of books. And a big question that Christians might ask is, should we even read books besides the Bible or besides Christian books? So what is your take on that? Yeah, well, of course, the Bible should be our primary book. We're people of the book, but only human beings read. And I would argue that that endowment called the image of God means that we're able to hunt and gather truth. So reading mm. other books, discovering truth, is I think a, a wonderful part of being made in the image of God. Absolutely, and you know, I think we always talk about the different types of books that we read and the, the different genres. Right. What would be the benefit in reading books and works of fiction and how will that make me better able to share my faith? Yeah, you know, C.S. Lewis, who is one of the great storytellers, talks about combining the Christian message with imagination. And when we can read books of fiction, when we can read books in literature, uh, these are, this give us a lot of opportunities to co-join Christian truths with other ideas. So reading gives us ideas. It helps us to understand what people out there believe how we can relate our faith to where people are in terms of worldview ideas. So I think reading is the natural thing for a Christian, and it can only help us be more successful in sharing our faith. Very good. So then would you recommend some of the books that we might pick up would be of different faiths, and would you would you recommend that, that we pick up books of, of different beliefs and different philosophies even? Of course, we have to be discerning and reflective. Mm -hmm. We always have to be on guard because the Bible talks about false beliefs. But I've written a book where I talk about the Christian faith, looking at Buddhism, looking at Hinduism, Confucianism. I think a Christian today needs to be familiar with the great world religions and be able to compare and contrast their faith with those religions. Something that you shared with me was it kind of like this bracket of Christian classics. Yeah, yeah. I was pretty fascinated by it and disappointed that as an avid reader, I hadn't read many of those books. But I, have you read all of those books? I haven't read all of them. I've read many of them. Mm. And it slows down. When you read a classic book, it slows your reading down because there's so much there. I mean, mm -hmm. Mortimer Adler, one of the great uh, advocates of reading great books says a great book is a book you can never exhaust. You never get to the end of it. So that's a whole list of books that was in uh, the 64 greatest Christian books. And what was the top book? Well, I, I have to confess, I wasn't <laughs> surprised. It was St. Augustine's book, Confessions, which I've read twice a year for the last 25 years. So it's twice a wonderful a book. Year. Yeah. Okay. Great book. So are there any other authors that you would recommend besides Augustine, yeah. anyone else you would recommend? Well, I think uh, C.S. Lewis, Francis Schaeffer do a very good job looking at culture and ideas. I think Tim Keller is very good mm, today at looking him. at cultural ideas. So, but you can never be disappointed by reading some of the standard classic Christian books that have stood the, the test of time and, and the confessions would be right at the top. And what about non-Christian authors. Are there any that you would recommend as giving a fair representation of their perspective? I think there are a good number of them. There are people out there that I, I would always read somebody who I think is fair-minded, who's careful, who looks at both sides. 
Uh, as Christians, we can learn from non-Christians. They're made in the image of God. They derive general revelation. So Christians should be eager to learn from anybody and everybody, including people that we don't share the same faith with. Well, thank you for that, Ken. Now, one last question. I've been trying every year to beat your reading challenge. How many books have you read this year? Well, I try to read two a week. So at the end of the year, it would give me a hundred. I think right now I'm about 106 or 107. Oh, I'm at 105. So close. <laughs> we'll try. Well, thanks again, Ken. Thank and if you want to learn more from Ken, uh, just check on reasons.org and keyword search reflections to check out his blog. Thanks for joining us this week on 2819. We hope we've inspired you and given you some courage to really just step out of your comfort zone and share the gospel with your friends and family. That's right. We know it can be intimidating sometimes, but we really hope that this show will help inspire you to think about the people in your life that God has supernaturally and strategically placed near you that need to know Jesus as their creator and savior. Until next time, be sure to check us out on reasons.orgs. We have tons of blog posts, articles, interviews, podcasts, all just integrating the latest scientific discoveries with um, how they provide evidence for the God of the Bible. You can also find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at 2819show. Yep, we'll see you next week. 